Well, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for the floor and uh, also for this very kind in, uh, introduction of mine. And uh, dear colleagues, uh, many things uh, have already been told today uh, on the history of codification of the Hungarian private law and also many things have been said about uh, the issues that emerged in the course of codification of the Hungarian uh, civil code, the new Hungarian civil code. Uh, I, I don't have a plan to repeat those thoughts. Uh, what I would like to do in my contribution is uh, taking a look at a civil code from a functional approach and uh, giving, giving examples on the basis of the Hungarian codification for how a civil code could contribute uh, to shaping uh, private law, the civil code or written law in, in general. So my approach is uh, not to give a historical overview and neither is to give uh, some presentation of detailed rules of, of the civil code, but uh, my approach is, uh, I would say, a method methodological one. I would like to find what a role a civil code can play in the existing law, and the existing law I mean the law in action. I believe that the words of Oliver Wendell Holmes, written in the introduction of his famous book on common law, have a general validity independently from time, geography, or system. He said that the life of law has not been logic, it has been experience. In this assessment, my focus is on the relationship of, between the role of the courts and the role of the legislator in private law. My starting point is that civil law emerged as a judge-made law. That is the natural characteristics of private law is that it is a judge-made law. Civil code is not an essential element of private law, Unlike, for instance, criminal law, uh, a legislative act is not necessary to create private law. That's why it is the question what kind of difference a civil code can make, what the role and the consequences of existence of a civil code uh, could be in a, a legal system. From this point of view, as a starting point, uh, I would like to refer to two American scholars because from comparative law, one of the things I have learned is that in order to understand our system, we have to be aware of other systems. And if we understand them, we may understand ourselves better. Uh, first, uh, I would like to refer to a sentence of Oliver Wendell Holmes who, who wrote in the path of the law, in other famous work of him, uh, in societies like ours, the command of the public force is entrusted to the judges in certain cases, and the whole power of the state will be put forth, if necessary, to carry out their judgment and decrees. Benjamin Cardozo, in 1921, in his famous work on the nature of the judicial process, wrote the following. Into the strange compound which is breathed daily in the cadron of the courts, all these ingredients enter in varying proportions. I am not concerned to inquire whether judges ought to be allowed to brew such a compound at all. I take Judge Maidlow as one of the existing realities of life, he said. And the question is, if there is a civil code, there is a civil law, a codified civil law, does it really make a difference? And my statement would be that no, or at least not as big one, and not where we would thought it. Because if you turn to the idea of Walter Wilburg, which, according to my opinion, gives one of the most precise description of how private law works in his famous speech on the Bewegliche system, in the flexible system, he described private law as a system of open rules. These open rules allow great power to the courts and let them to establish and to apply the proper guideline, guidelines to assess the cases. As a result of this system, a great part of the private law is shaped by the courts 
who, which apply a complex system of criteria to assess and decide the cases. There is one important guiding principle. The guiding principle is that the same case is to be decided the same way and different cases should be decided in different way. From this point of view, I don't think there is difference between the legal systems, at least, at least not the modern ones. I think there is a pitfall in, uh, in concepts uh, because uh, I think that's my experience that when we say low, we use the word low, we may have two different understandings in our mind. Because from one hand, the law may be seen simply as the order of the sovereign. That's just the order of the legislative power. This is a kind of up to bottom approach. The legislator says something and everyone has to obey. I think we would better call this as regulation rather than law. Uh, on the other hand, that, that's the other approach, law is to be seen as an autonomous order of organizing societies. Uh, this is a kind of bottom-up approach where the law is created and established by the courts via addressing social conflicts by their judgments. From another angle, I would say regulation prescribes clear-cut rules for social coordination, does not necessarily reflect values, and they mostly implement direct policy of the regulatory power. On the other hand, law is about transmitting social values. Professor Vekas referred to Niklas Luhmann from one point of how social concepts are to be used. I would add one thing to that, and that's also how Jürgen Habermas writes the law, because Habermas says that law is about converting plural social values into a binary code of right and wrong. If law implements social evaluation, then policy is also to be established by uh, the courts. If you see private law as this kind of flexible system, as described by Walter Wilburg, the role of the legislator is providing a basic evaluation. That's a very important role to provide the basic evaluation but it provides only the basic evaluation of the case because this basic evaluation can be overruled by the courts according to the social values that are relevant according to the relevant facts of the case. And the courts have different ways to do that. The first of them is the interpretation of written norm. Without going into the details of, uh, of, uh, of, of the concept of interpretation, Interpretation is about establishing the concept, establishing the content of the norm. If it, is, if it is the court having the legitimacy to interpret the norm, then it is the court who has to establish the content of the norm, which is a kind of creation of the norm, much more than simply to apply something which exists. Another way is applying the general clauses, which also have been mentioned a couple of times today already. Uh, Either we call it as a reasonableness or a good faith and fair dealing, public policy, good morals, and so on. There is a kind of variety in that. But in all of the civil codes, there are those general clauses, which are to give the legitimacy to the court, to authorize the court to overrule the written rule if it is established according to the social evaluation of the case. A third way of them is adopting very broad concepts. It has already been mentioned a couple of times today that the civil code uses abstract concepts. So using by abstract concepts, just a couple of examples like, uh, I don't know, duress, uh, mistake, uh, misrepres misrepresentation, and so on. So we don't even have to turn to general clauses, but also the fundamental concepts of private law are quite broad ones. And also the courts can use tools like implied terms or Ergänzen the fair track source legung in order to give rules to the parties, even if uh, such rules uh, were not provided by uh, the, the legislator. So from this point of view, I think one of the role of this, one of the roles of the civil code can be determining uh, the methodology and the structure of argumentation. Because if uh, we are lawyers in a codified legal system, 
then we think that our statements as to the content of the, the law is correct only if it is anchored in one of the provisions of the civil code. There is no some kind of general arguments like it, it comes from the social justice or we think uh, that we should create an incentive for this or that. So no very direct policy arguments are accepted by, from the courts, but we expect the courts and also the lawyers at the court uh, to use an argumentation where their argumentation establishes one of the uh, uh, one, one, uh, the application of one of the, one of the explicit rules in, in a civil code. Um, a second, is one, second one is providing a legal framework for phenomena of the society and economy. I think family law is a very good example for that because by family law, uh, the, the legislator provides the legal framework of the legal relationships of, uh, of the family. But I think uh, such a legal framework is provided by, by solutions like the Hungarian Civil Code did to contrast liability in tort to liability for breach of contract. Because if such, such a distinction is provided in the Civil Code, then our argumentation has to go in line with that. And it shapes our way how we saw legal relationships as well. As I mentioned, uh, it's an important factor also is establishing the basic evaluation. By basic evaluation, I mean the social value that is transmitted to this binary code by, by the civil code. I think a very good example of, uh, of the codification of the Hungarian civil code is uh, the issues of how unequal bargaining should be assessed, like uh, uh, whether the objective uh, difference between the value of, uh, of the performances could be a basis for uh, making a contract uh, unenforceable. It was very clear rule in the old socialist civil code that it is a basis uh, per se, it is a basis for, uh, for uh, invalidity but it, much, it has been uh, very much limited in, in the new civil code, simply because the social evaluation, the social assessment of this issue has been changed. That doesn't mean that it became absolutely irrelevant, but we don't think it's, it's important as it was before, simply because we have the very fundamental value of the freedom of contract as a kind of paradigm for the new civil code, and also because, as it has already been mentioned or, uh, by Professor Vekas, it has been modeled after the commercial relationship, the commercial approach, and, um, uh, and that's also uh, one of the consequences of that. Of course, the civil code also may uh, implement uh, direct policy, like uh, consumer protection, and also can implement a direct policy with a foreseeability limit by introduced also for the liability for breach of contract in, in the Hungarian civil code. It also may provide uh, some kind of uh, framework for uh, legal instruments that might have been used in the practice also on the basis of, uh, of uh, the uh, freedom of contract but we think that it may have some advantages if they are defined, like uh, the commercial contracts, also mentioned by uh, uh, Professor Reiner, uh, because uh, uh, in the new Hungarian civil code, that was the reason for having, uh, having the franchise uh, contract, uh, the distribution contracts, and also the, the, the trust in, in our civil code. It was clear that the trust relationship could have been created on the basis of the freedom of contract also before, but the problem was that in, in absence of this concept, the other parts of the legal system, uh, like uh, regulation on taxation, uh, were not able to address it because there was not a type of contract like uh, this. It may uh, confirm, I mean the civil code may confirm and reflect uh, trends in court practice, I think uh, the strict liability for breach of contract was uh, an example for that because we established that uh, it already existed in, in our court practice but not, was not clearly provided. Uh, 
uh, that there is a different measure to be used for exoneration of liability for contractual and non-contractual uh, relationships. And also it was something like that to do with, uh, with the protection of inherent rights of persons, uh, where also the civil code can overrule uh, the court practice. It was uh, also behind the revising of, uh, of the concept of, of non-pecuniary damages in the, in the Hungarian uh, civil code, where the legislator wanted to give a message to, to the court practice. That's not a Hungarian example. I think the law of Perush is also a good example from French law, when the legislator wants to give a message to the courts that you shouldn't do that again, because you went on the wrong way, and we have the power to do that. In order to give an example uh, for uh, how this uh, system of, uh, of, uh, of this, how, how this flexible system works and what kind of uh, social values one may, thought, uh, one, one may think of, uh, I would give you an example on the binding force of contract and there you, we may see how this whole thing uh, work. Because if you take a look at uh, to the basic elements uh, of the evaluation to be used to decide the binding force of the contract, we may identify basically four different social values. That means not too much, but we can identify four. The first, the first is the private autonomy. The strength of this depends on how informed and free the parties were in the course of contracting. We mean that more and more free and informed the parties were, we are less and less willing to declare their agreement as an unenforceable or invalid one. But if there is a lack of information or there is a lack of voluntary nature of the transaction, we are more and more willing to do that, say that no, it's not a valid contract because the market paradigm is this informed and voluntary uh, consent. Uh, the structural inequality of bargaining power, power is assessed by the consumer protection legislation. A second value is uh, the protection of reliance on statements and conduct of the other party. The question is, and this is a question of policy, to what extent such interests are to be protected? I think the statutory limitation of liability for breach of contract for a, to the foreseeability limit uh, in context of, uh, of breach of contract is a good example of that because the law provides uh, a protection only to a limited way to this, uh, this uh, reliance. A third point is what I already mentioned is the objective evaluation of the intended exchange. It's a question are and to what extent the rights and obligations of the parties balanced. Uh, it's important in consumer protection law. It's less important in commercial relationships uh, where, as I mentioned, there is only just a very limited way uh, uh, provided by the civil code to make a contract unenforceable on the basis of this. Practically, I think uh, this is restricted to uh, a mistake in the value of the thing, according to the Hungarian private law. And the fourth value is the responsibility and uh, self-reliance, simply because we think that uh, the idea that promises are to be kept is a fundamental uh, moral value. Uh, from this follows that uh, if you try to define the cre creation and application of the law, we have a traditional model. And normally, it, we have this traditional model in our mind that the courts apply the law created by the legislator. That's what we think of that. For public administrative law, that's certainly correct. But that's not right for, for a civil code. Uh, that means we shouldn't read civil code just a kind of regulation. Perhaps there are some parts of that, like consumer protection, which is very much like a regulation. And some examples have already mentioned uh, today uh, for this regulatory approach. That, uh, but the civil code is never a regulation. It's simply not about that. Uh, this traditional approach assumes a kind of hierarchy where the court uh, simply implements the order of the legislator, but as we have seen it, that's not true because the court also finds the law, of course, within certain limits, but actually does it. Um, I think the main tool for that for the course is, uh, is interpreting the norm. Uh, 
Um, from this follows that by establishing the content of the norm, at least in the area of civil, code, civil law, uh, the creation and the application of the law uh, shall not be very clearly distinguished. The court does not simply apply the law, but also uh, create the content of the law. And uh, that makes the difference between making the law and applying it uh, relative one. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.